Some say knowledge is power, but others say that knowing and doing are two very different things. We've all met people whose actions don't align with what they say they believe. Knowing stories and verses from the Bible isn't nearly as impactful as doing what God's Word says. For example, we know we're called to serve, but until we start serving, we won't fully understand how serving draws us closer to God. We know we're to forgive, but until we do the hard work of forgiving, we won't understand how freeing it is to let go of the past. We know God wants us to put Him first in our finances, but until we do, we never really understand how greatly God provides. When we live what we believe, our lives honor and please the Lord. Like a good dad, he loves seeing his kids grow into maturity and make wise choices. And it begins to shift our relationship with him. Today we are talking about Colossians, which says, All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. Perhaps you know what God is calling you to do, it, but you've yet to do it. I'm going to ask you to seek the Lord today, asking him to give you an opportunity to stretch your faith and show you something new about him. Will you join me as we pray to him this morning? Father, thank you for your word, for the way it sharpens us, for the way it encourages us to go to places we've never gone before with our finances, with our service, with our forgiveness. And for whatever it is that you're calling us to, I pray our, our, our eyes would be open and our ears would be ready to hear and our hands would be ready to do, Lord. We praise you in your son's name. Amen. If there's still breath in your lungs and a beat in your chest, it's time to worship. Lay down the cares of today and the fear of what's next. It's time to worship. It's time to worship. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise Him. If He's been faithful and kind, if His mercy's in you, it's time to Worship. If you're still waiting to witness His promise breakthrough, it's time to worship. It's time to worship. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, let everything that has breath praise Him. If we're going to sing, then let it be now. If we're going to dance, then let it be wild. If we're going to praise, then let it be loud. We sing hallelujah. If we're going to sing, then let it be now. If we're going to dance, then let it be wild. If we're going to praise, then let it be loud. We sing hallelujah. If we're going to sing, then let it be now. If we're going to dance, then let it be wild. If we're going to praise, then let it be loud. We sing hallelujah. If we're going to sing, then let it be now. If we're going to dance, then let it be wild. If we're going to praise, let it be loud. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. 
praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise Him. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise Him. Good morning, my friends. Today I'm going to share with you one of my very favorite things in the whole world. I'm sure you've all seen a ring like this. When a man and a woman get married, they usually make a promise to one another. And they say something like, I promise to love you for better or worse, even if we're rich or we're poor, if we're sick or if we're healthy, as long as we live. And then they exchange rings as a symbol of that promise. Mr. Graham gave me this ring almost 15 years ago, and we promised that we would love one another forever. This special ring represents that promise. Promises are important. People make promises every day, like this ring or a letter. A letter, just like you get in your mailbox, has a little thing in the corner, and it has a stamp. It also has a name and an address for who it's intended for. But the stamp is a promise. When the Postal Service sells you the stamp and you put it on your letter, it represents their promise to deliver your piece of mail to the person whom the envelope is addressed. It doesn't matter if it's cloudy or sunny, raining or snowing, hot or cold, the mail gets delivered and that is their promise. You are too young to have a credit card, but one day you probably will. Most adults have a credit card which they use to buy things. When you buy something, using your credit card, you have to sign a ticket. When you sign a ticket or the little screen at the grocery store, you're promising that you will pay for the items you purchased using the credit card. Your signature is your promise. People make promises every day, but do they always keep their promises? Unfortunately, some people don't. God makes promises too. The Bible is full of God's promises, but does He always keep His promises? Yes, He does. There are many promises He made in the Bible that He is still keeping today. We are going to learn about one of those promises today at Kids Connect. You are going to love it, I promise. Good morning. In the book of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is a comedy science fiction, a very weird book with a large cult following, the main character finds the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything, which after calculations over eons of time is determined to be 42. The answer to life, the universe, and everything is 42. Wouldn't it be nice if life were like that? It would be that easy. Today's message is titled Life's Biggest Question. Let me tell you a story about myself. When I was a boy, a good friend of mine asked me if I believed in God. And I answered, well, I don't know much about God, but I do know this. I believe that the Bible is true. Now, I wasn't a Christian then. I, I had never read the Bible. I only had an idea of who God was or who he might be. I didn't know why I even said that I believed the Bible was true, but that conversation stuck with me. Now, you may think that this was life's biggest question. Do you believe in God? But it's not. In fact, James chapter 2 verse 9 says, even the demons believe and shudder. Well, many years later, I was making plans to marry my wife, Lisa, and I was thinking again about what I had said to my friend. And I decided right then that I needed to know for myself what the Bible said about God. So, being a budding scientist, I made a plan to read the Bible. 
cover to cover in exactly one year. And I still remember it was 4.23 pages each day. What, what about you? Can you remember your first thought about God, his existence, what he might want from you? These are big questions, but not the biggest. You see, I tell you this story as an example of how God draws us to himself. I knew even then that the Bible was true because he put it into my heart. It says in Hebrews chapter 4 that God's word is living and active and full of power to transform our lives. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in the God of the Bible? Do you know what kind of God he is? Or have you made up a God to your own liking? Do you know that the Bible is true? Is that why you're here today? Is God drawing you to himself? Is he revealing himself to you in the scriptures? Again, these are big questions. At some time, we all need to consider the big questions of life. But it's much easier to just put them off into the future. And we live in a culture that trivializes the important and makes trivial things important, don't we? Perhaps you are dealing with other big questions today, like where is your life going? And how will you know when you get there? And what will you do when you get there? Or what kind of life do you want for yourself? A, a comfortable, easy life? A, a fun life? An exciting life? A life of meaning a purpose and fulfillment? And what does that even mean? Well, the letter to the Colossians provides answers to the most basic questions in life. It's timeless. It speaks to us today. It speaks to our age and our culture. And it gives answers to our deepest questions about life, the universe, and everything. Paul wrote this letter to the church that we would understand one thing above all else. It's the key that makes everything else begin to make sense. And that's this, that Jesus Christ is preeminent of surpassing excellence, surpassing value in everything, in all things. He's the answer to life, the universe, and everything. It's like a lens. When you look through it, everything becomes clear and in focus. You know, every part of Scripture testifies about Jesus. From Genesis to Revelation, Luke 24, verse 27 says, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, Jesus explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And in John 5, 39, Jesus said of the scriptures, he said to himself, it is these that bear witness of me. So here it is. Life's biggest question, the most important question you can ask, is, who is Jesus? This short section of Colossians gives a dramatic and powerful answer that has the power to transform lives. Let's start with who is Jesus in relation to God. In verse 15, it says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Jesus is the perfect, absolutely accurate image of God, the exact representation of God's nature. Jesus himself said in John 14, 9, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. The invisible God became visible. He is the full and complete revelation of God. God in human flesh. Jesus claimed this himself, and it is spoken of throughout Scripture. To think anything less than this of him denies the clear teaching of Scripture. It's not just someone's opinion. I think C.S. Lewis may have said it best when he said that Jesus was either a liar or a lunatic, or he's Lord of all creation. Now, firstborn in this verse doesn't mean born first, nor does it mean that he was created. It refers to position or rank and importance. In both the Greek and the Jewish cultures, the firstborn was the son who had the right of inheritance. 
but was not necessarily the one born first. For example, Esau was born first, but Jacob was the one who inherited. And in Psalm 89, 27, God says of the Messiah, I shall make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth, the preeminent one. Let's look at who is Jesus in revelation, relation rather to the universe. In verses 16 and 17, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus is the creator of everything. The universe, from the smallest particles making up an atom to the vastness of the universe, he created it all. How powerful he must be. What knowledge he must have. What wisdom to make it all work together. And what beauty, what intricate detail. Psalm 19 says, The heavens proclaim the glory of God, and the skies display his craftsmanship. Paul says in Romans 119, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse, he says. Paul is saying that it, that it is only through our willful disbelief that people reject the truth. Both the Old and New Testaments declare that Jesus existed before the world began. Revelation 22.13 describes Jesus as the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Christ is outside creation, prior to it, distinct from it, and sovereign over all of it. For it was created by him and indeed for him. In him the purpose of the universe is found. And that last statement, in him all things hold together. I love that. Not only did he create the universe, <clears throat> he holds it together. He sustains it. I think he must hold atoms together. For no scientist has yet been able to explain why they don't just fly apart. Nor can science understand what gravity is. <laughs> in all things, in him all things hold together. Who is Jesus in relation to the unseen world? These verses talk about that too. Verse 16 says, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. I love Ephesians 1.20 where it says, God seated Jesus at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body. Which brings us to the next one, who is Jesus in relation to the church? Well, verse 18 says he is the head of the body, the church. You know, Scripture speaks of the church using many different metaphors. A, a family, for instance, a kingdom, a vineyard, a flock, a building, a bride, and here, a body, his body. In each of these metaphors, Jesus is the head. The body of Christ, a living organism controlled by Jesus, giving it life and direction and purpose. Jesus energizes and coordinates the members of his body, the church, and gives spiritual gifts to individuals to build up the body. Yes, Jesus is preeminent in everything. Philippians 2 verse 8 says, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee 
should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I can hardly read these words without feeling the need to get on my knees before him. We were created to be God's beloved children, and then we alienated ourselves from him by our own rebellion, and we had no way to be reconciled to him. Our debts were way beyond our means of repayment, but Jesus could and did pay our debt for us, thereby reconciling us to God by his own death. How do you respond to these truths about Jesus? To paraphrase the great theologian of the 17th century, John Owen, this knowledge of Jesus deserves our most serious thoughts and considerations, our highest praise and our admiration, and our utmost diligence to heed his every word. I said at the beginning that we need to ask the big questions about life. The biggest question of all is simply, who is Jesus? because the answer to that question changes everything. Where do you put your confidence? In yourself, your abilities, your spouse, your family, your government, or in Jesus? What sustains you day by day? The security of your job, your investment portfolio? What will be your greatest achievement in life? And will anyone remember it 10 years after you're gone? Or does Jesus sustain you, give you direction and purpose? Is Jesus a liar, a lunatic, or your Lord? Do you really believe what the scripture says about Jesus? We all need to ask this question this morning. I need to ask it moment by moment. If Jesus is Lord of everything, what will my life look like today? This moment. Can I be satisfied with Jesus and what he provides? He provides peace with God, an internal peace, an eternal security, assurance of your standing before God, unconditional love, unbelievable joy in knowing God through Jesus. <laughs> knowing Jesus is better than anything. It's like waking up to find you're the son of the richest man in the world who just happens to be the king of the world too, and that he's totally good and he loves you more than he ever, that you could ever imagine. It's just too much to believe, too, too much to even imagine. And yet scripture tells us that it's true. So what should we do in response to who Jesus is? You've been hearing Graham say, God is transforming our lives by the gospel and we've been given the ministry of transformation to those around us. I have a secret to share with you. He didn't make that up. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, if anyone is in Christ, and that means joined to him by faith in him as your savior, your rescuer, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And that means our old desires and our loves that went with our spiritual condition have been replaced in our spiritual new birth to a new life filled with the exciting things of his kingdom. And then verse 18 says, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. What a privilege to know who he is as revealed in his word, to know him as my savior, and to be his ambassadors, taking the message of reconciliation to those around us. What a privilege. What love the Father has lavished on us through his son, Jesus. Let's pray together. Our Father, what a, a glorious message you have given us in Colossians. Our hearts are full as we contemplate who Jesus is and what he has done and how he sits at your right hand today, Father, resurrected. And the power that you give us through your Holy Spirit as we are in Christ, 
our Savior and our Lord. We thank you. We praise you. We glorify you this morning because of what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen.